Content warning. This episode contains depictions of mental illness and intense emotions. Hello friends, this is John Holmes welcoming you to part 2 of the Destination Yesterday production of The Shambler from the Stars. To fully understand the investigation which is in progress, you're advised to listen to the story from the start. You will find links to episode 1 on the Eyes for Investigate website. And now, a brief recap of part one. Owen Blakewell of Eyes for Investigate was tipped off about the strange, suspicious death of horror writer Philip Trulove. Mr. Blakewell met with the head of the Department for Parascientific Research, resulting in the IIFI taking over the investigation into Trulove's death. A neighbour of Philip Trulove was interviewed about the night of the fire, telling of odd sounds and a strange red cloud near the house. Investigation of the Trulove house was interrupted by the arrival of an odd man, a doppelganger trying to gain entrance. We resume the story with Jennifer Morgan and Anton Sorensen searching the kitchen at Philip Trulove's home. <sighs> I doubt we're going to find anything interesting in here, but he had good taste in kitchenware. Wow, those are big apples in that basket over there. I wonder where he got them. I don't recognize the variety. Do you, Tony? No, but it seems like every time I go to the store there's a new variety available. Should we check out the cookie jars and containers on the counter? We have to be thorough. But no nibbling. (laughs) Party pooper. (laughs) <laughs> Not even a jammy dodger. Okay, on to the dining area. The entrance to the dining area was through a pair of Old West-style swinging doors. A really nice touch. Tony and I pushed through them to see an interesting sight. A basket on the dining room table held a collection of unrecognizable produce. Beside the basket was a large green squash-like thing. It almost seemed to be breathing. You'll find images of this on the website. I stepped forward to look out the back window and motioned Tony to join me. There, in the garden, was the strangest selection of plants I'd ever seen. That is heel hool. That's amazing. It's beautiful and it's weird. So he managed to convince the neighbors that they were just rare Chinese vegetables. Why not? He likely made up a good story. After all... He was one of the best authors of strange fiction, yes. (laughs) Speaking of strange, uh, there's something strange about this room. Yeah, there should have been a door through to the living room. Most odd. I assume there must have been one in the house originally, but he had it sealed up for some reason. Maybe just so we could put that beautiful sideboard along the wall. It wouldn't have fit in here otherwise. We checked the drawers of the sideboard, but they only contained silverware, good china, tablecloths, placemats. Having finished with the ground floor, we headed upstairs. The front rooms proved to be of little interest. There was nothing unusual to be found in True Love's bedroom, but there were a variety of hand-drawn protection symbols on three of the walls. They were each about three inches square, very artistically rendered, and actually gave the room a good feel. The bathroom, too, had the hand-drawn symbols, but nothing else noteworthy. In the room where True Love's body had been found, the air seemed foul despite the fact that the window was completely gone. The holes burned through the ceiling were covered by a large tarp. The room must have been very attractive. It was nicely laid out with a Victorian writing desk, bookshelves, and a pair of ornate chairs by a small table. 
One of the walls had been decorated with paintings which were now unrecognizable. Well, nothing made of paper will have survived this. Oh, well. I was looking forward to his next novel. It was the last part in his Dunwich Terror trilogy. Well, maybe it's already with his publisher. Who knows? I hope so. I'm amazed the downstairs ceiling seems fine. The fire has left the items on this shelf blackened. I think that's a Nebula Award, but I can't tell what the other items are. But I think I see something familiar. The amulet hanging in the center. Could you get a close-up of it so we can have the fire services retrieve it for us? Consider it done. So what do you think it is? Looks like one of the symbols connected with an old cult. The Church of Starry Wisdom. Oh, wow. I've heard of them. They were in the news a lot in Canada in the 60s and 70s. We were taught a bit about them in sociology class. Now that must have been interesting. Well, our course covered a lot of material, so it really didn't delve too deeply into any one area. The Church of Starry Wisdom were used as an example of an extremist cult. We were shown old articles in which members were bemoaning how the police were harassing them, you know, claiming the cultists were responsible in some missing persons' cases. They said they were being victimized. We actually had a mock debate in class where three of us took the side of the police and three others argued for the cultists. Oh, who won? Uh, well, the cultists won. <laughs> I was on their side and I hate to lose a debate. Oh, Jennifer, playing devil's advocate? I'm shocked. Nay, outraged. Outraged, I say. Outraged? Ye would be outraged by a tear in your stockings, knave. <laughs> when Jennifer had finished taking photos of the den, we moved on to the last room. What should have been a spare bedroom had been converted into a library. There were shelves of burnt books and the remains of a chair, a small table and a standard lamp. Next to the window opposite the door, there was a badly burnt wooden statue shaped like a man with the head of a bird. I wonder what that was. It looks kind of Egyptian. Thoth, the god of reckoning, learning, and writing. Appropriate. You have enough photos? I think so. Should we head back down? Maybe we could take another look at that mysterious cupboard in the living room. Okay. As we descended the stairs, I thought I heard a car pull up. I was right. It was Owen's taxi. He got out of the cab and looked around him, admiring the day, and then waved at someone out of our sight. He waited a minute, watching something. Then he smiled and walked towards the house. Anton unlocked the door and opened it as Owen walked up the path. Hello, all sorted. The silly pair was sitting in a red Volvo, of all things. Little doppelgangers looking for attention. The G-men have got them now. <laughs> G-men? Gary and George, big guys, the best. They'll take their little amulets away and give them a free ride to the officers of the DPSR for questioning. I've told our boys to make sure they don't do a complete memory wipe on them. Oh, and before I forget, I brought this. Choose one of these amulets as an anchor for your protection spell. Oh, wow. Amber. I love amber. Consider it yours. I'll help you create the spell after the meeting today, OK? That reminds me. I left Nan taking care of the food. So, were we ready to go? Not quite. Come check out the living room with us. Oh, wow. I love the decor. And he has one of those alien communication set thingies. Oh, how I wish I'd made contact with him before this happened. We shouldn't touch that. Wait a second, yes, we should. What's going to happen to all this glorious stuff now that he's gone? Hmm, yeah, we'll take the set. Hey, I wonder if this is what your visitor wanted. Really? I didn't know it was anything important. It could be if you know how to use it. I don't, but I think Nan might. Or someone at the DPSR. Hey, wait a minute. If that's not what you wanted me to see... It's cupboard doors at the bottom. 
I just couldn't get them opened, even though there doesn't seem to be any locking mechanism to them. A musical lock. I love these. They're not very safe, but they're so cool. Hmm. Give me a minute. The puzzle's rather vague. I'd say it's a B natural. That could open both doors. I just need to put my index fingers on these notes and... Have either of you got perfect pitch? Oh, there you go. I hit B when I ask a question. That's assuming I was right and it was a B. And B's for blimey. <laughs> are those what I think they are? Oh, yeah. Seeds. A cupboard full of deadly weapons. If someone wanted to misuse them. Yeah, <laughs> I see what you mean. Well, I don't. Do you mean the seeds is in the ones he used to grow those plants in the garden? I thought they were weird, but safe. We can get into that at our meeting this afternoon. These have to be taken with us, very carefully. Could you find something we can put them in, Jennifer? Well, there's a big plastic bowl in the kitchen sink. I'm sure it would hold all of them. Will that do? Perfect. If you can wrap them up in paper towels or dishcloths or whatever, it'd probably be a good idea. They're absolutely harmless, unless they break. OK, I'm on it. While Jennifer took care of the packing, I decided to take a few minutes to show Owen around the house. He agreed with me that the amulet on True Love's study wall was something we'd want to take a closer look at. Before we left the property, we went out to the garden and I put a soil sample in an envelope. Meanwhile, Jennifer had found a couple of shopping bags in the kitchen and was filling them with samples of all the different produce. The next-door neighbor, Mr. Armitage, waved to us through his kitchen window. He then disappeared briefly and came out through his back door, walked over towards us and spoke to Jennifer. Hello again, love. Quite a garden, isn't it? It certainly is. Owen, this is Mr. Frank Armitage. Mr. Trulove shared his vegetables with him. Oh, that's nice. So you like the vegetables? They're wonderful. I think they've improved my health. My doctor's amazed at how good my blood pressure and sugar levels have been for the past year and a half. These plants are Chinese, you know. I was wondering if you'd ever seen anything like them before. Not in person, but I've seen drawings of something like them. But did Mr. True Love ever warn you not to try growing them in your own garden? Or not to save the seeds? Oh, yes. It's very stern and insistent that I say an oath promise not to do that. I thought it was a bit over the top, but you know writers are a bit strange and fanciful. So I said the oath and tried to keep a straight face. He said that if the soil wasn't prepared just right, there could be a chemical reaction and things could become infected with... I don't know what. That's true. These vegetables usually aren't grown on this in this country because they can be very dangerous. Whole families have died. In fact, I'm going to have to have a team come over and destroy the garden for health and safety reasons. Oh my, I just had some in a salad. That's just to be safe now that Mr. True Love is gone and can't take proper care of them. Isn't that right, Owen? Oh, ah, yes. That's right. You really should take some while you can. These are perfectly fine, and it's a shame to see so much go to waste. We're taking some ourselves. Yeah, see? I filled two bags. Well, they are very good, and everything's so expensive today. Or to get good vegetables. Still, we'll have to think about it. We left Mr. Armitage by the garden and went back inside. I let Owen and Tony take everything back to the house for our meeting, and I opted for the duty of getting a taxi and returning the house key to the fire officer. I showed Murphy the photo I'd taken of the amulet over the desk, and he said he'd have it brought to our office, a.k.a. Owen's house, within 24 hours. By the time I was done, Ben and Sylvia had arrived for the meeting. They hadn't been waiting long and were just having a bite to eat before we looked over the true love items together. Owen took me aside and led me to the kitchen. Jennifer, I'd like you to meet my grandmother, Kathleen O'Clary. Nan? 
Jennifer Morgan. Jennifer, it's about time we met. I was starting to think Owen wanted to keep us apart. Now, why would I do that? Because you didn't want to explain to her that I'm a witch, perhaps? I can't believe someone with a magical name like Jennifer, the modern Guinevere, would have a problem with that. Jennifer means the fair one, a magical blessed spirit. And a Morgan is a water sprite. Do you like the water? I like to visit the seaside. Yes, and Kathleen means pure, and you're talking pure... Language, Owen. Come on, ladies, grab a drink and join the meeting. I sorted the post from True Love's house, and we're going to start with a couple of those items. I've just made a pot of coffee, but there are cold drinks in the fridge if you'd prefer. Oh, a coffee sounds perfect to me. There's oat milk or cream on the fridge door. And we have demon rara sugar in the bowl on the table. Demon? Oh, that's demerara. Owen always called it demon rara when he was little. Still does. I've just fallen into the habit. I quickly sorted out a cup of coffee and followed Kate through to the parlour. Owen, Tony, Ben and Sylvia were seated around a coffee table with food spread out in front of them. The alien communication device, which acted as a centerpiece, was the current topic of the discussion. I'd love to see the insides of that, wee beastie. Take it to the lab and x-ray it. Don't bother. There's nothing inside but crystals. It's just a telepathic accelerator unit. <clears throat> okay. If we're all comfortable... We'll start things out with this lovely blank postcard with descriptive text in Rulian, identifying the image as the Church of Starry Wisdom. It doesn't look like it's been through the post, but the slight indentation near the middle says to me that it was stuck in Trula's mail flap. I'll pass it round. So what does it mean when you get one of these stuck through your door? Could it be an invitation? Or a warning, maybe? Yes. Oh, either, I suppose. Our next item's a very interesting letter, dated 1st of June. Dear Philip, thank you for your kind words in regard to my latest story. It means a lot to me that you found it engrossing and in need of very little editing. I've made the suggested alterations and submitted it to strange sagas and have high hopes for acceptance. As to the other matter, although I wrote letters to the people for whom you so generously provided addresses, none were willing to help me in my quest to locate the forbidden books of ancient law which I desired. While many did not reply, Those who did were most abusive and threatening. Despite this, I've had amazing good luck and found one of the tomes locally, in an old used bookstore of all places. They obviously didn't know what they had and I acquired it cheaply. My only problem now lies in the fact that it's written entirely in Latin, and my knowledge of that language is minimal. If you're willing to translate, I could bring the book over at your convenience that we may share in the secrets held within. Now wait for this. But I have not yet told you the title. It is De Vermis Mysterious by Ludwig Prynne. Oh, no. That's amazing. amazing. Your loyal friend, Brett Lawrence. The Mysteries of the Worm... That's trouble. I wonder where the book is now. If it lives up to its reputation, it's not something that should be in the hands of, well, anyone. I read somewhere that when Prynne wrote this book, he included the spell he used to summon invisible servants from the stars. Do you think the stories could be true? Looking at it from the perspective of the events we're investigating, it might explain the strange death of Mr. True Love. It was certainly something unearthly that killed him. Going back a step, if we're to believe that Prynne summoned these things as his servants and we're operating on the assumption that true love, knowing Latin, read this spell, why would it kill him? 
Was it only Prin who knew how to handle the servants? Good point. But what if Lawrence actually could read Latin, and he went to True Love's house and summoned the servant and ordered it to kill True Love? I suppose it's a possibility. I should also mention that I've had a message from our old friend Charlie at the DPSR. He's tracked the arsonist, and it won't surprise you to learn that it's our correspondent, Mr. Brett Lawrence. So, as for the request from James, now we've found him, I should go and talk to him. But would he be willing or able to tell us what happened? You know, from the way the train station staff described him on the night of the fire, whether through guilt or shock, he was in a poor state of mind. I wonder if that's changed much. Well, if I can come up with a good reason to visit him tomorrow in Ipswich, I can find out. But I need a cover. Something that won't make him suspicious of my intent. Just look at it realistically. He's an up-and-coming author, a local talent. And what do we have? The recent death of a man who championed local talent and fostered local writers. If I were still a journalist, I think I'd be looking at writing a series of stories on, uh, you know, local authors, linking them to Mr. Trulove's contributions to the community through advice and editing. I'm sure an intrepid journalist, who happens to be a fan, could talk him into an interview. Have you read any of his work, Owen? Actually, I have. There were a couple of logic flaws in his last story, but if you got past those, it was quite entertaining. We'd need ID cards. Do you think Henry Carlson could arrange that for us? We? I think you need an experienced journalist with you. Do you indeed? Hmm. I'll give Henry a call as soon as we're done here. You've got a quick and devious mind, Jennifer. Why, thank you. (laughs) Okay, now that's sorted. Would you like to share your findings, please, Sylvia? Okay. I was able to find two newspaper articles relating to missing persons and the Church of Starry Wisdom. The first one, dated November 1st, 1926, is from the Suffolk and Essex newspaper, and it's entitled, Are We Being Visited? The Shamblers from the Stars. It's about an odd thing that happened outside one of their churches at Beltane. It says that, An earthly sound emanated from the building and strange red lights were seen in the sky. The sounds are described as chanting in a foreign language and screeches. The reporter only went out that night because the locals told him that things got a bit wild at the church around Salwyn and Beltane. Here's an interesting bit. The reporter himself saw strange, formless, ghostly red shapes floating awkwardly on the dark side of the building, swaying as if moved by an unfelt breeze. Deciding to approach closer to examining the seeming apparitions, I was admittedly terrified when they, as a group, rose up sharply into the sky and disappeared into the distance. After that, the police arrived and sent everyone home, but he saw seven officers headed up to the church. Apparently they broke up the service, giving the cultists the option of leaving the city or facing charges for disturbing the peace. Jennifer, are you thinking what I'm thinking? I think so, Tony. That red cloud that Mr. Armitage thought he saw outside True Love's window, didn't he say that it suddenly disappeared upwards? Exactly. Maybe we found our connection. Oh, and then there's a medallion over True Love's desk. Someone from the fire station's going to grab that for us. I'm sure it's an old starry wisdom design. But was he just a collector of oddities... Or was he a member of the cult? I hope he wasn't a cultist. I love his writing. But on the next article, and this one mentions the cultists as well, it's just a torn out snippet from some paper. But looking at death records, I was able to date it to September 28th, 1926. The title is Teenage Boy Found Dead in Farm Field. It doesn't say the cause of death, but the boy they found was the second who had been killed in six weeks. Then once again, the townsfolk blamed members of the Starry Wisdom Church. It cuts off there. It was just roughly torn from an old newspaper and stuffed in a file. Great work, Sylvia. Those were just the newspaper articles. Surely you want to know about the letter. What letter? 
Henry told me of its existence. Something talked about amongst newspaper workers in Norfolk for a long time, apparently. In his will, Dr. Godfrey McKinney left a letter to a young journalist he respected, named Simon Green. This was in 1947. He asked Green to try to get it printed, but it didn't seem to hold out much hope that it would happen, adding that he didn't want his friend to jeopardise his position. And indeed, the newspaper Green worked for would not touch it. But that didn't stop Green. He just took it around to other papers in the area in hopes that one of them might accept it, and one finally did. That's a great job of tracking. Thanks. (laughs) Thanks. <laughs> Maybe you can pay for my new glasses since I'm getting an eye strain from all these searches. <laughs> I'll read you the bits that are important to us, but I'd really advise everyone to check out the full letter. I wish it to be known that I was forced to withhold evidence under threat from the authorities regarding the case of J.T., whose body was found in an almost unrecognisable condition on 3rd of June, 1926. When I performed the post-mortem, I found that his back and neck had been not only broken, but nearly crushed. The force required to inflict such an injury far exceeds that which can be exerted by even the strongest human being. It is important to note that no deep finger imprints or bruises were present on the body. There were, however, round marks which I would associate with the application of strong suction. These were liberally darted all over the torso. On closer examination, I discovered that each suction mark had a puncture in the centre as if the skin had been pierced by a needle. This was most alarming when considered alongside the fact that the body had been completely drained of blood. There was no blood in the vicinity of the body, and the theory put forward by the police to explain this was that the boy had been murdered elsewhere, and his body, well, he goes on to prove that the reasoning of the police was, well, complete rubbish. They just wanted to sweep it under the carpet. That hasn't changed much, has it? I think you're being a bit harsh, Ben. But what an amazing find. And that was nearly a hundred years ago. Yes, And I bet there are cases which go back further than that. But Sylvia, you can start working with Ben on the Angel Papers now. That scratched the mental itch of thinking this had all happened before in this part of the country. Okay, so next up, we have a box to open. It's fairly heavy, Ben, and it's closest to you. Do you think you can open it, or should we just take it to the lab and do an x-ray for now? I've been studying that, and I think, if you don't mind me using a couple of your skewers to exert pressure, I can see how it works. By all means. Here goes. And there we have it. And inside we have a black rock covered in hieroglyphs. My first instinct is to say that it's a piece of the stone that the Migo worship. Well, that's to say, it's been assumed that they worship it. They don't like to lose them. I've no idea what purpose they serve. So, two items from Yugoth. Fascinating. Speaking of Yugoth, what are you going to do with the vegetables? Well, eat them. Nan, do you have a copy of Yogsothos' cookbook? Don't be a silly ass. From what Tony was telling me earlier... You should be asking that neighbour for recipes. He's been eating them for over a year, apparently. Point taken. Jennifer, I get the feeling Mr Armitage likes you. Could you see if he has any suggestions for how to cook them? OK. Anything I get will be popped up on the server under Alien Cuisine. And that brings us to the seeds. We'll have to share those with the DPSR and DEFRA. Tony... Do you want to explain them to Jennifer, or shall I? You tell her you were there. But I can't believe they didn't include the McCurdy Farm affair in the DPSR training. Tell me about it. Well, Jennifer, there was a farm near Dumfries in Scotland where a man reported a meteorite landing on his property 15 or 16 years ago now. 
I was with the Department for Parascientific Research at the time, working with a partner named James Gilman. When the authorities in Scotland realised it wasn't a typical asteroid, they sent an alert to the DPSR. James and I were ordered to rush up and close off the area. James understood the significance of all this, but it was my first big investigation. What the farmer had reported as a meteorite was actually a giant pod. After they land, they start to shrink, and the seeds, there are usually two or three, eventually sink into the soil, where they break open and release a gas which seems to promote growth. You could say they're self-fertilising. Now, if one of those seeds breaks open on unprepared soil, that is, soil unlike that of Yugoths, chemical reactions take place. They contaminate existing plants and animals and alter their DNA. The plants grow to amazing dimensions, but they're empty. They lose all nutritional value. They rot quickly. People who are infected slowly go mad. Their DNA breaks down and then... Then they start decomposing while they're still alive. You have to understand that this is an extremely rare event and there's never anything strategic about the places which have been hit, making us believe it's an accidental occurrence rather than an intentional attack. Still, we have no idea why it happens. We keep an eye out for any activity, of course, and studies are ongoing to understand how to counteract the effects. That soil sample from True Love's garden should help scientists make progress there. But back to the story. One of the seeds did break on the McCurdy farm before we could get there. We set up a special medical team to study what was happening and try to help the family. But I was eventually told, about two years later, that they'd all died. It was all hushed up, of course. Not hard to do, since it's sort of in a very remote area. Yes, but since Mr Truelove planted the seeds in prepared soil, there was no danger and the produce was safe to eat. I'd just like to know how he got a hold of those seeds. And what he did to prepare the soil. Yes... I wonder if the soil treatment requires something else only found on Yugoth. That poor family, what they went through, my God. It's so unfair. Yes, it's rotten when terrible things happen to innocent people. Are you okay? <laughs> yeah, uh, sorry. Never be sorry for caring, got that? Thanks, Owen. Come on, Chuck. Show us the amulet you found that had fallen down the back of the couch. Classic find, that. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Ta-da! Here it is. I'll pass it around. Jennifer Morgan, from your studies, can you tell us who is represented on this medallion? Is it Dagon, Owen? Correct. You have just won a... Jam donut. But are you willing to trade in that jam donut for a chance to win a slice of chocolate cheesecake by answering a two part question? Yes, I am. Ooh, you're a gambler. Listen carefully now. Please tell us one, the name of the cult that worships Dagon and Two, the name we've given to the race which he represents. That would be the Esoteric Order of Dagon and the Deep Ones, Owen. You are absolutely correct. Sorry, but we don't seem to have that chocolate cheesecake. Would a slice of apple pie be okay? Hmm, 
Is there vanilla ice cream to go with it? Yes, there is. And you deserve two scoops, at least. Come on, dessert time, folks. Remember, I get two scoops. Owen, I didn't want to say anything in front of Jennifer, but if there is a copy of Demo Vermis Mysterious around, that could be extremely dangerous. More so than any other case that you've dealt with. Jennifer is quite new to this. Watch out for her and, well, be careful. Do you think I should ask her to work on research and the website with Sylvia? Goodness, no. That would be an insult. She's strong and will be an asset to you. I'm not saying she isn't capable, far from it. It's just that this is going to be a baptism of fire. Having shared her concerns, Nan headed for the kitchen. Before I joined everyone there, I called Henry Carlson, the newspaper reporter, to ask him to get ID cards for me and Jennifer. He was happy to do it and said he'd bring them over when he finished work. I quickly sent him a couple photos he could use. After dessert, I helped Jennifer complete her protection spell. Then, while the rest of the team listened to the raw tape made that day and checked out the photos Jennifer had uploaded and had a discussion with Nan about the telepathic accelerator unit, Jennifer and I went over a plan for approaching Brett Lawrence, deciding to meet at 9.30 at Norwich train station the following morning to travel to Ipswich. Finding out about Brett Lawrence filled in a couple of pieces in a vision I'd had. It was now obvious that Brett Lawrence was represented by the jester, juggling burning sticks and leading me down a corridor to the lions and the water horses, the heraldic animals of Ipswich. Henry had arrived with the ID cards and joined us for a while. It was getting late by the time everyone left. I considered it a very productive day, but I knew that we had a long way to go with our investigation. I stood with Owen on a street in Ipswich looking across to the home of Brett Lawrence. We gathered our courage and walked towards the house and up the path to knock on his front door. You're sure the recorder's on? You have to prime it and... I know how to use it. Trust me. Okay. Here goes. Mr. Lawrence? I'm sorry to bother you. I spoke to the editor of Strange Sagas magazine and he gave me your phone number. I tried calling, but... I, um, I haven't been well. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, I'm a journalist. Here's my ID. And I'm doing a series of articles on writers in Suffolk and Norfolk. I'm trying to raise the profiles of local authors. I think you folks could all use some good publicity. I got the idea when Philip Truelove died. It seemed Why that... Why are there two of you? Ah, I'm just learning the ropes. But you may have read articles by Jennifer Morgan. Hello, Mr. Lawrence. Uh, yes, the name is familiar. Like Mr. Truelove, you have had a few stories published in Strange Sagas magazine. I know that it was through that magazine and others of its variety that Mr. Truelove started his career over 20 years ago. The editor, Edgar Baird, told me that Mr. Truelove was very generous with his time and helped a lot of young authors get started when he moved to Norwich a couple of years ago. Mr. Baird said you were a particular favourite of his. He said that? About me? Yes. Oh, by the way, he mentioned that he's about to publish another of your stories. He said I could tell you that you should receive a letter from him in the next day or two. Congratulations. I've read your work and it's really top-notch. <laughs> really? Wait, are you recording me? Well, yes. Uh, is that a problem? 
We don't want to get anything wrong in the article. We want to quote you accurately. We always record things these days. It's so much friendlier than sitting and scribbling things in a notebook while we talk, don't you think? I don't know. Could you please spare us some time? It would mean a lot to me as a fan of your work, and I've come all the way from Norwich this morning to talk to you. A fan? I guess... uh, I could. Okay, you can come in, but only for a short time. I need to... rest. My observations are being recorded after the fact in our studio since they couldn't, for obvious reasons, be done on site. Mr. Lawrence led us into a room with all the curtains drawn. Fortunately, the fabric was thin enough to light the room adequately. Brett looked as if he hadn't shaved, washed, or changed his clothes since the day of the fire, and he was very thin and gaunt. He seemed unsteady and disoriented. I assumed it was from lack of food and sleep. He led us to a room, a combination living room, writing room, and recent bedroom, I would guess, which was in disarray. He hurriedly covered up what looked like drug paraphernalia, which had been lying on the couch. He had a large writing table with two trays on it, one for blank paper and one with written items. There was a stapler, a small bottle of whiteout, and an old mayonnaise jar full of pens. Beside the desk were several boxes of carbon paper. There was no sign that he owned a computer, no TV either. All evidence pointed to him being a technophobe, so I tried to keep the recorder out of sight so it wouldn't spook him. The only other things in the room were a set of shelves and a large table in a far corner. On it, there were small tools and a set of paints scattered around the beginnings of a new project. He was building a model house from scratch. The shelves contained books and a couple samples of completed models, They looked very professional. Uh, We can sit in here. Thanks so much for agreeing to see us. I'll get right to the point so we don't take up too much of your time. Maybe you could start by telling me how you approach story writing. Any little tips that might help novices? I've... Always uh, read a lot. Horror, you know. But there was never enough to read, so I started to write my own stories. I was never satisfied, even when I was first published. I wanted to write better stories. Stranger stories. Philip Trulove is... was the best. I'd spend a lot of time researching things I read in his books. They seemed so... real. Yes, for a man who didn't travel much, he seemed to have an understanding of the ways of the people and their motivations. Such imagination. I don't think I could ever invent a whole new world and strange alien civilizations. He didn't travel. Why did you say... (laughs) I think he traveled enough. Really? I got the impression that he only went out when it was necessary and never for very long. (laughs) Oh, but when he traveled, he went to some very interesting places. Not often, I guess, but I envied him. Marvelous places. Do you mean the book signings? (laughs) Book signings, of course. I first met him at a book signing on the other side of the river. That was about... Four years ago. He was... kind. Have you been published in any magazines other than Strange Sagas? I'd love to see more of your work. I wanted to write a novel. A a great novel. A story that would shock and terrify the world. Now... now I don't have the time. And I... I wonder... No time? Oh, yes. I was told that you work at a local theatre. Carpentry, isn't it? And helping with rehearsals, feeding lines. Sounds like a great job. It's empty. They do silly plays. Nothing nothing rich. All bland. That may be so, but I don't know how they could stage anything like your work. I guess they'd have to do it in one of those modern formats. Minimalist. Empty stage. Creatures on strings. What? No, of course. Uh, They can't do my stories. I asked. They suggested I write something as a Halloween special. Something everyone could enjoy and get a little scare, they said. Halloween. 
fools. Yes. So, are you a self-taught writer? Do you just have a natural talent? Yes. Uh, mostly. I. There's a special group. Uh, Mr. Baird arranged the classes for young authors who regularly contribute to his magazine. He, he keeps the fees low. Do you mean Edgar Baird? The Strange Sagas editor? Uh, yes. Uh, Tuesday nights. I, I don't know if they help much, but I go. Sometimes. Have you written anything recently? <laughs> <laughs> Only the best story ever. The best story ever. But it's so sad. So sad. So sad. Why did I send it to him? He's hes a great teacher. He understands me. He's not like the other one. It'll be okay. No one will know. Do you have a copy of it here? What? Your new story. Do you have a copy of it here? Why do you want to know? We could ask our editor if he'd like to serialize your new story. No, and... you can't have it. It's mine. I, I... I wish... If only things had gone differently, I would be famous. Why did he read it out loud? I couldn't stop him. I, uh, I couldn't think. The words. Those strange, incomprehensible words. It's okay. We don't mean to upset you. We want to help you. Just relax. Relax? <laughs> I've forgotten how. A day trip is a good way to relax. Did you ever visit Mr. True Love in Norwich? What? Visit him? Once? Uh, no. It's been suggested by the police that there was someone in the house when he died. Since you knew him, I wondered if you'd have any idea who that might have been. Uh, no, no, that's not right. He was alone. He he was sick. He passed out and knocked over a candle. The the newspaper said it. That's that's what happened. He uh he had a heart attack, maybe, and knocked over a candle. That's what happened. Of course. I read that story too. You said you like to read a lot. I can see that it would be a great way to become inspired, learning about different people, ways of life, cultures and practices. Yes, uh, yes, I, I think reading and analysing are, are very important. I was given an interesting book that you might like to borrow. De Vermis Mysterious by Ludwig Prinn. Have you ever... The book? Uh, no, it, it's gone. You, you don't have it. Nobody has it. It's just... gone. Someone... someone f found the book? There was an old Latin book found in Mr. True Love's den under his body. It wasn't very badly damaged since it was protected from the fire. Oh, my by... God. Don't let them read it. Don't let them read it. It'll come. It'll... It's okay. It's okay. They couldn't read it. They don't know Latin. <laughs> no, no, not many people know Latin these days. That's, that's good. You know the book, then. Is it yours? Did you loan it to Mr. True Love? Mine? Mine? Is it mine? Uh, uh, no. Uh, yes, I, I loaned it to him. A, a, a long, long time ago, I loaned it to him. Can you read Latin? No, no. A word or two, but it's mine. I bought it. I can bring it back to you. I've got it at my house in Norwich. Do you want me to bring it here tomorrow? I can read Latin. Uh, no, 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 no. It'll come. It'll feast. No, 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 not again. <laughs> Shh. Calm down. Calm down, Mr. Lawrence. I'll leave it where it is. It was at this point that Mr. Lawrence curled up in his chair, sobbing. Owen gently questioned him, asking if there was anyone he wanted him to contact to come and stay with him, to take care of him. He said there was no one. Owen got Brett to tell him which surgery he went to. I then called them to let them know what was happening. 
They recommended that I call the police and explain the situation so they could attend the house and remove Mr. Lawrence from his home under Section 135. Reluctantly, I made the call. We waited for them to arrive and did our best to comfort the author. After a discussion with the officers, we said goodbye to Brett and then started to walk back to the railway station to wait for the next train to Norwich. By the way, I noticed you looking at his supply of carbon paper. Yeah, so he has a copy of his latest story, but he's not going to be telling us where it is any time soon. Agreed. You know, I can't help but feel sorry for him. Poor fella. He just got too caught up in his writing. The idea of the perfect horror story has become an obsession. Yeah, if only he hadn't found that book. I mean... What were the chances of a Latin copy of an extremely rare book being found in a second-hand bookshop in... Oh, hell. We're idiots. He was supposed to find it. He was set up to find it. He must have been. How would they do that? And why? Well, let's think about it. In that letter, he said he'd written to people to get hold of, well, rare occult books, forbidden knowledge... I can't imagine those people were happy to have some outsider asking them about books that they wouldn't want to admit that they owned. Since they knew what he was looking for, one of them may have suggested that he check out a certain used bookshop, and then it was planted there so he'd find it and eventually read the summoning spell and, well, meet with a sticky end. More fools them, since he doesn't know Latin. I suppose if someone's looking for books of that sort, people would assume that they must know Latin and other languages. If not, getting hold of the books becomes pointless. Yes, but I still think True Love could have been the target from the start. We know that he provided Mr. Lawrence with the addresses. Nobody likes an informer. And he used Latin phrases in his novels sometimes, so they knew he'd be able to read the book. Okay, let's suppose they might have wanted to get both of them out of the way. Whatever the truth is... Someone is pulling strings behind the scenes. Looks that way to me. Now that's a person I'd like to meet. I wonder which used bookshop he went to. Do you think he'd tell us? We can only ask. Come on. They might not have left yet. We were just in time. Mr Lawrence was holding a large plastic bag with the sleeve of a sweater hanging out and was getting into the back seat of the police car. The officer in charge was happy to give us time to ask him a question. (sighs) Mr Lawrence, Brett... (sighs) Can you tell me where you bought the book by Prynne? I think I should go to the shop and make sure they don't have any other dangerous books. We wouldn't want anyone to get hurt, would we? What? Uh, No, no. (laughs) Not again. Then can you tell me where you bought the book? Was it a shop here in Ipswich? Strange shop. I never knew it was there. All the years I've lived here. Odd. It looked like it had been there forever, so... Old and dusty. Where is it, Brett? Shh. (laughs) It's on Silent Street. And the shop is called... The Dream Ends. Funny name for a bookshop, don't you think? Yes, it is. And thank you. (laughs) Don't read those books. Not the forbidden books. You'll be sorry. I thanked the police officer and gave him one of my combined business cards for the Department for Parascientific Research and I as for Investigate, asking that they keep us both informed of where Brett would be staying. I wanted to visit him and make sure everything was going to be okay once he was settled in and feeling, well, safe, I guess. We watched as the police car drove away and then once again, headed for the train station. That must be one hell of a story if he really wrote about what happened at True Love's house that night. You'd think he'd just do it as therapy and destroy it after an experience like that. 
Do you think he actually sent it to his writing teacher? He needed someone to see it. Just writing it wasn't enough. At least he still had enough sense to know that sending it to his publisher would have been a dangerous move. So we find out who his teacher was and we get a copy of the story that way. I hope it's that easy. Well, why wouldn't it be? Now let's see, shall we? A man growing plants from another planet in his garden is violently murdered by a non-human force. A writer goes insane and tries to burn down a house. Doppelgangers sit around in a Volvo and a red one at that. Yeah, you're right. It should be easy to get the story. This is John Holmes, and you have been listening to episode two of The Shambler from the Stars, based on a story of the same title by Robert Block, adapted for podcast by Michelle Perry Brooker, with additional material by Neil Brooker. The cast included Matt Blissett as Frank Armitage, Neil Brooker as Owen Blakewell, Samantha Dunlop as Kathleen O'Clary, Jonathan Inbody as Brett Lawrence, Brian Karasek as Benjamin Wiley, Tobias Nielsen as Anton Sorensen, Michelle Perry Brooker as Jennifer Morgan, and Samantha Underhill as Sylvia Grant. Content warning by George Williams. Music, sound design, and audio editing by Neil Brooker. This has been a Destination Yesterday production.